plastics. Uh, I brought in machines from China. It was $1,500, the shipment from China. But from the port in Lagos to Abuja, it cost about $1.4 million. <laughs> now, um, also things like, we, we now have a universe of retailers. And therefore, competition is intense. Those are the things that will affect, if you start a business today, that there's probably so many people doing the kind of business you're doing, and all of you are retailing, because we're not yet producing stuff. Even the business that I'm talking about that I set up, the machines were, of course, we have a few options in Nigeria that are not very efficient. You bring in your machines from abroad. And of course, we still have a problem with originality. So I will be using these kind of indexes that we should measure for ourselves to replace at least five things that are on the ease of doing business World Bank index right now. Number one, there's something called ease of paying taxes. That is on the World Bank, which we are measuring. I'm not sure it's very relevant, but say, to the Nigerian business that's test setting out, an SME, for example, is not thinking, before you set up the business, say, oh, uh, when do we pay taxes? First of all, you have to do business and make money before you begin to think of paying taxes. They are talking about things like cross-border trade. Of course, we've closed our border right now. We have good reasons, uh, in part. Uh, however, I don't know how long that will last. We're looking at AFC, FTA, swinging in, fully, in which case we have to open our borders and only worry about things like uh, you know, uh, rules of origin, as in where are those goods coming from. If you can prove that the goods actually originated from Togo, but under AFT, FTA, we are under obligation to allow them to come in. So things like cross-border trade is measured by the World Bank 1. I'm not sure it's very relevant. In fact, when you think of the fact that, through like my friend Ferdinand Adimefe uh, there, these are techpreneurs. Techpreneurs don't have borders already. Whatever it is you produce in Nigeria has no border. You can only, we can slice uh, through it and say, okay, fine, there are some advantages that a, a business like that based in the United States has. For example, how did Google become so big? How did Facebook become so big? They had some access to global satellites and all that. They had support from their government. Let's not deceive ourselves. But I, don't th I think we should begin to think about what we do. Things like protection of minority interests is what they are measuring. So you will see that the World Bank Ease of Doing Business tries to measure how well a conglomerate can do business in Nigeria, not how well a Nigerian business can do well in Nigeria. In fact, one of the more ridiculous ones is ease of declaring bankruptcy. <laughs> yes, it's there. There are 10 factors being measured, and these are, at least I mentioned for Then the last one I mentioned is ease of acquiring landed property. Many businesses don't have to acquire landed property now before you do business, really. Uh, so, anyway, this is where we are. So, what are those countries doing well? I think those countries, uh, first of all, have ensured considerable level of security for themselves. When I was coming in here today, they uh, accosted me on the red carpet and asked me a few questions. And, I, and, of course, the idea is that the private sector is the one that's supposed to provide almost all the employment in society, given, but I'm a contrarian as an economist and as a writer. I'm a contrarian, I believe that there are some items that are not bankable. For example, the security of a country. The security of a country cannot be given over to the private sector. The private sector can come in at some point. You're right, but the security of a country, if you have a scenario where most of our young people are running to South Africa, and the route to South Africa we may not know. There's a route that goes from Nigeria to Niger to Libya, and people swimming across the Mediterranean. A lot of them die in the desert. Many die in the Mediterranean Sea to get into Europe. But there's another route that goes through Cameroon, into Gabon, into South Africa, where those boys go through. We, we haven't actually documented that. There's another route from South Africa that goes through Brazil, into Panama, all right, and then tries to get into the United States. And we have all these African people, especially Nigerians, populating all those routes. So one of the things they've done is to ensure fairly adequate security. You went, if you go to Ghana, you will see, you know, Europeans getting into their buses, like in their downfalls, if they are Keken affairs, if they have any. But here we believe that when the Europeans are coming, they must be inside uh, people's scenes and so on. That doesn't work. So they've ensured that one. They've ensured a certain level of sanity in terms of corruption. There's corruption everywhere, mind you. Mind you, there's corruption everywhere, but it's not as blatant. One of the things I think we should do, which is very critical, if you were traveling to our airport till today, you see many of the operatives there begging people for money. And it's very, very shameful. On a couple of occasions in Ghana, a couple of them have, have brought, which you bring? 
But they're trying to learn from us. I just pity them. He said, look, I hope you don't learn from us. I was standing behind someone, a Chinese person, in the airport the other day when one, some of us were saying, oh God, what did you bring for us? I felt quite embarrassed. And what, are you, what do you need that money for? And we can actually solve that problem. All you have to do is to bug that, that place and let them know it's bugged. And that someone from the presidency is listening into your conversation. And make a scapegoat of a couple of people who will sanitize that and be able to at least get a bit of respect from those who are looking for business from us. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Um, clearly, what we're going to tell you is that the young is a big business parameters. There are several other factors that uh, inform the nation of uh, investors in the economy. Uh, yes, I've rented into some of the basic hygiene factors. Uh, but I'm going to go to the organ. Uh, can you tell now specifically what are the critical factors that a very, a very foreign person will take into cognizance in deciding which country or which economy to invest? Uh, I've been dealing with investors across the Europe, mainly European region, and I can tell you an example why, for example, investors choose to be in Poland instead of Ukraine or Russia, or if someone investing in this region, uh, they prefer startups to go to Poland and to set up there, they do not, in, in, do not want to invest in cross-border. And there are four, probably five major factors why they don't, don't want to do so, which most of them were actually mentioned. First of all, is the level on uncertainty because of the economical situation of the region. And actually, whenever a VC company, venture co capital company, and startup hubs and stuff, they start attracting um, startups to Poland, and there was a very, very, very kind of long way for Poland to create small Silicon Valley. But I do believe that actually going a little bit innovative. Uh, is a key to starting uh, attracting different kinds of investors and investment and pumping up the economy because uh, Poland does not let's say Poland does not have uh, did not have good economy before like we also went through all this way and we started attracting investors of course we allowed some foreign companies to come and to uh, start their businesses there but nowadays, uh, if you look 10 years back, like all the managers were foreigners, uh, mainly from like Germany, France, and other regions. But now, uh, almost all of them are Poles, right? So you can tell that there should be someone who will teach you the governance of the company. Uh, if the people, if there are no people here, like are not enough, right? Because uh, in Poland we have very few, only those who are working abroad and came back to implement all these strategies that actually big companies. Uh, that actually big companies could afford. The second point, I think that supporting small businesses is very important, which uh, not many kind of countries uh, do, but I do think that incentives that are available for the smaller businesses and not pushing them down with taxes does a lot. So um, actually that's the second key factor. And my favorite example about the politics and about the availability in taxes and uh, in general cultural thing for the business governance is uh, the case when IKEA, you probably all know the brand, or IKEA it's called, uh, to enter Indian market it took them more than 10 years. Just because first they wanted the government, they of, of course they said like we are going to create thousands of workplaces, uh, but please adjust your policies your uh, political situation and uh, allow us to have like major of shares and we will do infrastructure of course there was a long way to negotiate the deal uh, but it's still possible and in many cases fortunately or unfortunately the background is legal right so unless as a lawyer I can tell you that unless we have certain rules and certain policies implemented like uh, especially if you are going for like the union here in uh, Africa and then for sure, uh, legal background should be somehow probably not similar, but you should do, uh, you should make feel those investors to, to feel secure. Because uh, if you want them to come, you should give them, give them some value. It's not only about money, but also about how you are going to deal with the business later on.
Thank you very much, Olga. Um, the best thing I'm going to end with talking about the legal environment, which is one of those issues that are some measured in the ease of doing business. Uh, the ease of which we should resolve the service issues, the ease of getting credit, and those, those are the factors. But that's something that we uh, need to uh, talk about, and that is uh, the fact that beyond the issues of uh, improving the ease of doing business, there are also the heavy lifting that don't seem to be uh, that they're being done today. Um, she did mention about the issue of Poland considering trying to create the Silicon Valley. And look at what countries like Ethiopia, um, India did. They created uh, special economic zones. I remember at some point the Minister of um, uh, uh, Trade and Investment was trying to create similar economic zones in the country. Um, okay, as a government representative and advice of the President, please can you tell us exactly what has happened to that economic uh, zone that the federal government was trying to create? Johnson. I should start from talking about what exactly ease of doing business is and what this administration has been working on since 2016 because I think that there's been a misconception that it's all about rankings. So the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council was set up in July of 2016 really to look into the problems that are being experienced by small and medium sized enterprises. So the World Bank doing business is an empirical scorecard that is one part of it. It goes through the life cycle of the business from inception, that starting a business, to insolvency, that's when a business fails. Now, the feedback that we work on is based on stakeholder engagement with private sector. So when people say it's so difficult to start a business, and we worked with CAC from about six manual forms, and it used to take quite a long time, and reduce, reduce it into one automated form and you can register in one day, then that's leveraging automation on problems that are particularly pertinent to young entrepreneurs, which is one demographic that we pay a lot of attention to. So we look at people issues, we look at process issues, and we look at infrastructure. The idea is to reduce the cost of doing business, to reduce the time it takes to do business, and to make sure that there's a lot of transparency so across the board, we work with about 50 plus uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. And as I said to you, we work with uh, the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, the competitiveness part of it. The second section looks at regulation, legislation. So the project spans across, there's about 13 ministers on the council, uh, Minister of Finance, <coughs> Minister of Trade and Investment, is chaired by the Vice President, of course, Minister of Information, Foreign Affairs, really everybody that should be in the room, Minister of Transport, Works and Housing, Power, Police. And the idea is that everybody that is in the room to, that's needed to solve a problem is there. We also have, of course, the head of service as a member, the secretary to the government, high level representation from the National Assembly, from the judiciary, and from Lagos and Kano states. So it tells you that it's a very robust intervention. As all that was talking about, if you take, for example, legislative environment, we work very closely with the National Assembly. I should did mention we passed two legislations on a, a collateral registry uh, and then on getting credit so that you have a legal basis underpinning our um, corporate history, our credit histories. We have three credit bureaus in Nigeria. Now, what this means is that when private sector want to access credit, for example, so these things sound uh, simplistic when you're talking about the life cycle of a business, but when you pull uh, um, MSMEs, they talk about access to credit. They talk about two things. They're talking about hard infrastructure. They might talk about power. They might talk about roads, rail, broadband. If they're talking about soft infrastructure and regulatory challenges, for sure they will tell you about access to credit. They will talk about payment of taxes. These are not things that we made up. These are things that we've had through engagement across the country. We've been working at a subnational level with every state governor in the country since 2017. And what that does is it makes sure that as businesses work across state lines, they're getting access to information, they're getting to know where the data is, what is, you know, what the environment is. If you want to move your business to Adamawa, 
you can know the kind of infrastructure that's there, the security challenges that are there, access to information really key. Now, regulations are another thing that are very important. When you talk about the big things, and I think that you know, more small businesses would agree that tackling the small everyday irritants that they come across are really what makes their lives and the business environment um, easier. And when you know that MSMEs account for over 90% of the businesses registered in this um, country, and that about 80% of jobs are created by them, and they contribute just under 50% to Nigeria's GDP, then you know why we focus on them. Now back to the special economic zones, the project is still on. Of course, we had a change of administration, but the project is not there, it's still on. The, minister of, the new Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment is just still settling down, but there's a, continue, there's a continuum and the work is still going on. So you have a number of projects, the Made in Nigeria Initiative, the Special Economic Zones, um, trademarks, a number of things that the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment had done in the last administration are just been taken to the next level. So the work is still going on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's good to know that that's, uh, that has not been arrested. No, it hasn't been arrested. And I want to say that none of the projects, whether it's from the hard infrastructure bit, when you talk about access to broadband across the country, um, the vice president working with the National Economic Council, with the state governors to make sure that that's one of the catalysts that we've identified for the country, uh, the rail projects, the road projects going on across the country in every state has at least one federal road being worked on. The power projects, the willing buyer, willing seller intervention, the IPPs in the markets, none of these projects have stopped even for one day. So, okay. yeah. Good to know. Not to paint like a super rosy picture, but it's work in progress, it's slow, it's steady, it's hitting the point. It's a systemic intervention. And the worst thing is to get distracted. You started off by asking me, what are we not doing? I think across the continent, what perhaps we've not done and what I alluded to is go with a systemic intervention that gets the results. Nigeria has been recognized, you can't even game it, you can't fake it. We've been a top 10 most improved economy for the second time in three years. Everybody likes good perception, we've moved up 39 places, it's not artificial. So when you say that sometimes businesses are not feeling it, yes there might be a lag, but we're working from the roots, the legislative interventions, the legislative, the regulatory ones, making sure that we have transparency, that we're going after consequence management. Those of you that know about the executive order one and what that says, and it applies to every MBA in this country. Also, the report .ng, which is our report, is an app, you can download it as you sit here. You can report up to at least 20 agencies for consequence management. So these are things that I think a lot of the communication needs to be improved and which is why we accept invitations like this so that we can tell more audiences uh, like this what exactly is going on. Because I think that a lot of people don't know and then they see rankings improved and they're like, but I don't feel it. But maybe if they got to know and they tested it, then they would become the evangelists for the reforms and then it would work better. So. I think it's quite, it's quite uh, happening to, you know, because one of the questions somebody asked me uh, at the function on Sunday, on Saturday, was that all this improvement on ease of doing business, that they are not seeing the impact. But I said, look, <laughs> it's not like, there's no light bulb effect. You're not going to switch on the, uh, the uh, put on the switch and the light, the hand will come bright in the, uh, immediately. There's a gradual process, and I'm happy that, okay, she so added that, what they are doing with us. But let me come back to uh, talk with. Talk to you. I did mention the party, an economist, politician, publisher, everything you know, one. And uh, you wanted to be the president of this country. And one of the concepts that would drive, drive somebody to want to be the president of the country is that you are things you would have done if you want to do differently. Today, Jumoke has told us that we are all the projects that government has started are still ongoing, but we all agree with me that the progress is slow. Take one of the issue of infrastructure, physical infrastructure. The government has continued to build physical infrastructure, particularly road network for major education. Last year, we spent about 1.65 trillion naira on uh, capital expenditure. 
which, if you compare to dollar, if you look at the magnitude of the shortfall we have in the financial is just a floppy direction. What would you do to talk about? Or what would you suggest to the government that will fast track this process of building infrastructure? Because uh, in the long run, we are all dead. If we continue the building infrastructure, the rate we are going now, I'm not sure I'm be to see good road network and good uh, rail network across the country. Maybe my great grandchildren will witness it. So, what exactly do we need to do to jumpstart the growth of this economy the way countries like, um, like Malaysia, Singapore did? And in the an African country like Ethiopia is doing correctly. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I'll, I'll speak very quickly. Uh, uh, there's a few things to say. Uh, I would first of all want to say, well, government has done well, especially in the area of availing credit through those interventions in CBN, DOI, and so on. Uh, however, as, as, as an entrepreneur myself, as someone who I left banking in 05, you know, we used to be in General Express Trust with Bank together, myself and yourself, although you were you are a CFO then, you know, we are there. Um, but um, you know, as an entrepreneur myself, I will tell you that most struggling people, all right, in our environment, who if they tell they want to go into business and you ask them what is their biggest business uh, uh, problem, they tell you it's money. However, you know, but let's be very sincere. Um, usually it is not just money. Um, if people will tell you that sometimes you have to, you know, have an idea and have a passion about what you want to do. So now the government has done well in giving money, but a lot of the money is also being lost. This morning in the newspaper, we saw a report where uh, CBN said they would have to recover 35 billion naira given to farmers in Borno State. And part of what I read there, they said most of that went into rice. And you see all of these things going on with rice smuggling in Nigeria. In fact, I have a thesis, a theory rather, that many of those uh, rice smuggled into the country are also being retrieved into local rice. Because again, rice, so rice, you can get rice, expired rice, for next to nothing in some parts of the world. If you bring them in, you show, you bring it to Sydney and say, look, we have produced rice. Is it the same rice that we're talking about? And I also wrote an article last week, I said, Nigeria's rice bubble. Whether the government, the government is spending too much on rice already, even we, the people, just like you had the tulip bubble in, in the Netherlands, uh, way back in the 1700s and so on. Even we, the people, are paying too much for rice. All of a sudden, we're paying almost 40,000 for a bag of foreign rice. And over almost 20,000 for a bag of local rice. Is it worth it? So, please, we have to go back to this idea that credit is what we need. But I must admit, government is doing well in the area of giving credit. And of course, but again, I must quickly say, too, that uh, part of what we were saying earlier on, of course, infrastructure is also a problem. Uh, but I also always want to bring people's attention back to what we call in economics uh, public good. Public good. You see, the lack of public good or the lack of investment in public good, commercial investment, is part of the reason why we are in this situation today. And what are these public good? Things like education, right? Uh, China was able to trump uh, the West in the game of globalization, which you can see that it is the West that's trying to roll back globalization now with Trump saying we're closing our borders, we're imposing tariffs, we're doing this, we're doing that. China was able to do that because they prepared their people. When companies were shutting down in the West and relocating to China, they were able to find people who could do the work for one twentieth the cost, labor cost, of what they, what they would find in the West. But the people were prepared. Are we educating our people? Why is it that we go to Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, somebody did a project in the estate I live, a big man, did a project where a number of the houses in our estate were occupied by people from Côte d'Ivoire and Togo and Ghana because those are the laborers he brought in. He's a big man, he put them in some of those places that we pay a lot of money for. But he put them in those places, come and do a certain project for, for him. So that means that some of those countries, Togo, uh, Ghana, um, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, they seem to be training their people better. Unfortunately for us, what most what we've seen a lot of our youth doing, we got into this get rich or die trying thing. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, quote and unquote. Entrepreneur. And many times we've seen in recent times a few of them being busted to be fraud. Because you can't be an entrepreneur and be, uh, be dancing and swimming in dollars. Like I saw one guy doing on WhatsApp yesterday, throwing the money up and down, betting on it on the spread. 
You can't be an entrepreneur and do that. Not to carry from the ground up. Funny enough, I have no brand credit, even though I work in the banking sector. It is very incredibly difficult to obtain loans, except you go and get, except they are your friends. And except you are in Lagos. Yeah. 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 So very quickly before my time is up, I'll say that look, we have to refocus on this public good. Education, train your people well, especially and including in vocational and technical skills. In with Nigeria, when during the Good Lord Jonathan era, Ghana was one of the places we sent youth to. There's a in, 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 right in the center of Accra, close to the president's house, you see the Ghana Vocational Center where you train people in every kind of hard work. And they are proud of it. But you can't even see that a lot in Nigeria. A lot of our institutes that are supposed to be doing that, they are dead now. I worked on the Orosai report, the BPSR, two years ago. I saw that we had all of those institutes, but nothing goes on there. We also have a few board members coming to meet them, collect test and go. I mean, whatever it is. Now, so we have education, health, your environment has to be in a certain way. There's a lot of investment can do in that area. Security, as I mentioned before, and even basic housing. United Nations rapporteur was uh, just left Nigeria about two weeks ago. She wrote a report and in fact she was shocked that Nigeria is, has one of the most precarious situations with public housing in the world. That 70% of Nigerians live in ghettos and it is true. We have no plans for them. Instead we are building luxury houses which are unoccupied. We have hundreds of thousands of those luxury houses in every every state capital in Nigeria, especially in Abuja, more than 300 houses, uh, 300,000 houses are unoccupied, yes. most of them luxury, some of them with, with swimming pool that is green, is my giant. And so, we are not doing anything for this. So, we have to do from the ground up. If you have this kind of situation, you will certainly have security problems. And when you have security problems, nobody will come and invest in your In fact, the people who have money in your country will take money abroad. Someone said, that when we go abroad looking for money, those people are always wondering, that because the same man that's saying you come and invest in my country, he's also asking you, please, where can I put money in your country? <laughs> so he wants to put his own money in your country, but he's saying come to my country, they're not mad. So please, for your question, sir, um, I would say, what, what you know, the terms of fiscal infrastructure is there, I would say what we need to look at now is how to do it differently. You mentioned the, the energy sector, the power sector. I was reading a report recently that MPDHC, in fact, this morning, Niger Delta Power Holding Company, they interviewed the former uh, MD, Mr. Olutu, JJ Olutu. He said that they had invested $8 billion since they started. Now, we keep on, we, we criticize the size of Pastor government for spending $16 billion on the same power sector for eight years and not getting results. MPDH, MDPHC alone said they spent $8 billion. So let's look at the other uh, stakeholders. And also, so please, I will say one bullet point. One bullet point, Mr. Johnson, please. Uh, Mr. Chiku. Uh, Mr. Chiku. One bullet point I will say, sir, it is time for us to do it ourselves. Three billion dollars from the World Bank will not solve our problem in the energy yes. sector. Never. <laughs> sir, it is time for us to do it ourselves. Running for president, I came up with a model. Even though none of you here voted for me, but it is all. <laughs> I position myself as the ideas person. One bullet point. The only way you will solve that problem in the energy sector, as well as most other sectors in Nigeria, is to plug in the energy of our youth into it. I said that for you to solve our energy problem, ask them, ask Olga from Poland, how they did it in Poland, or in Germany, or anywhere. <laughs> our students of, in, of in our universities and polytechnics, the so electronic, ele electrical, electronics, electrical engineering should be given projects to start to light this country up from the ground up. Take 10 or 20 of them, go to the nearest village to you. That is your project for this semester. Let them start this project from year one. If you can power the place by solar, by, by, by stream, look, there are mini hydro. In fact, if you went, you see there's a guy, and he didn't go to university. He created a mini hydro, a mini hydro turbine that he puts in the stream near, 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 their, near their village. And he powers a couple of, uh, of above. That is the way you power in Germany. What they did after the Second World War was the engineers who power their houses, power their houses. Then they gave their labor. Then, before you know it, they powered their village. Then they connected the villages to the town. Then they connected it nationally. That's a national grid. In Nigeria, what we're trying to do, we bring the plants. Look, I was speaking to somebody who okay. wanted. Sorry, sir. <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> do you know that I 
as I speak to you, some of the some of the some, some of the engines, some of the machines imported under the uh, ambassador for the for the for the uh, for the for the, for the plants that they built in Niger Delta are still in the ports because they did not reckon on how they were going to take those things to those places in Niger Delta to work. So we are very great at wasting money, and we're just wasting our time still until we look at what I'm doing ourselves. <laughs>
the people that are feeling the reforms are beginning to talk more about it. So I do encourage this demographic. That's why I came, because I suspected many of you may not know about the PEVEC or our work. But please download the app, check out the website, attend this day. We're on a road show right now. Uh, we started the kickoff in Lagos. We're going to Imo on Thursday. Then we're going to Ekiti, then Jigawa, Borno, Delta, um, Edo as well. So please join us if you're in any of these places or if you have friends there. And please do just be a partner. Thank you very much. As uh, she's making uh, her exit, I'm going to open the discussion to the uh, members of the audience. And in doing that, I want to give us a quote that was uh, actually made by Bill Gates when he visited Nigeria in March 2018. He said Nigeria has a mighty economic potential, but what has become, what becomes of that potential depends on the choices by Nigerian leaders. Um, and I want to broaden that quote slightly. And I will say that Nigeria has a mighty economic potential, but what becomes of that potential depends on the choices that are made by Nigerians, not just Nigerian leaders because um, we are all contributory to what fit that will befall us. So I want us to look at uh, issues that we're discussing today and let's have your questions or your thoughts on how to make this environment the most conducive investment destination, not just for foreign investors, but for all those of us, local investors. Um, we want to hear how this way the street paint is. And we also want solution driven um, interventions. It's not just uh, about how, what is wrong, but what we need to do to address those things that are wrong. So I think um, with that, I want us to, if you, those who won't have any intervention to make, can raise your hands. Okay. Any other person? Okay. Thank you very much. I can see three, four hands. Okay. Uh, okay. I can see more than six now. Let's start from you then to go to uh, Thank you, Chair. It's a pity that uh, Dr. Duole has left. I want to congratulate her for the good work she's doing. But there's a limit to what she can do. Let's take the issue of physical infrastructure, something like roads. I mean, some of these solutions don't require money. We have to now not take it inside the box, throw the box away, like Soludo will tell you. The solution, the first thing, federal government should hand off all these so-called federal roads. They are too far from where these roads are. Yeah. Any road can be federal roads should be thrown in the federal. Otherwise, hand over the construction of roads, take it to states, so that either the states or adjoining states can come together and pave those roads, because those are the people dying. Two, I'm tired of hearing the FCC chasing money, money every time. Why don't you check the quality of these roads? Roads that were controlled by Omiya Sons in the 60s, some of them are still existing. But it's the only Nigeria where you 